Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's the 19th of March, 2013, and our special guest is Jay Cross, author of Informal Learning, Rediscovering the Natural Pathways that Inspire Innovation and Performance. Jay, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. I'm on this tenuous internet connection. I apologize, but it does mean there might be a slight lag uh, when I speak. But uh, that we have a forgiving audience, so thanks for understanding. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Mighty Bell, Menko, and Blackboard Collaborate for support. We have some great virtual conferences coming up. Jay's going to love this. I don't think he knows about these events, but they're massive peer-to-peer -peer learning experiences. They are free. They're for practitioners to share with each other. Almost every presentation is accepted. They're held typically over the course of uh, 24 hours a day in the number of days of the conference. Uh, on the 28th, we have our first one coming up this month, which is the School Leadership Summit. Uh, we've had an overwhelming response. Uh, it's going to be a full day. It includes uh, keynotes from Bill Brennan, Yong Zhao, and Michael Fullen, and then about 60 sessions from practitioners. Uh, after that, uh, at ISTE, we have the ISTE Unplugged activities, including the all-day unconference, which I know Jay will love mm -hmm. as well, called Hack Education with Audrey Waters this year. That is the Saturday before these events are all free. Go to ISTEUnplugged.com to see our Fringe Festival at the conference. Uh, we have a number of other virtual conferences coming up this year in the same vein. Uh, the STEM conference with Hewlett Packard, the Future of Libraries, and the Global Education Conference, and lots more coming up. Go to web20labs.com to stay informed. Coming up on this show tomorrow, a sponsored event, Gina Bianchini talks about the power of groups and the new features in Mighty Bell, which really is a great program. <laughs> Gina hires me to provide services for free to educators, so I have to you do the full disclaimer, but do know that uh, Mighty Bell is really a terrific product. Adam Bessie comes on to talk about GERM, the Global Ed Reform Movement. Uh, then we have the, the School Leadership Summit. Matt Hearn talks about de-schooling. John Hattie on visible learning. You can see lots more coming up there uh, on the show. Hope you can join us. If you've missed any of the shows, they're all recorded. They're in full. Blackboard Collaborate form and an MP3 version. Adit Harrell, uh, Harrell Caperton talked to us about connect constructionism. Sorry, constructionism and her work with Seymour Papert. Um, that's actually going to come up today, I think, a little. Paul Thomas talked to us about poverty and the role of poverty in education. Uh, Chris Mercoliano talked to us about um, the the absence of childhood and the effects of how we're treating youth on education. Richie Norton on the power of starting something stupid, Roger Shank on cognitive learning. Anyway, lots up there, all free and available to listen. So those of you who are in our live studio audience, it's just a chance that you get to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the second icon down, the star icon, and then you can click on the map. It's always fun to have you shout out in the chat where you're participating from, maybe the time and the temperature. I'm in Byron Bay, Australia, which is gorgeous, although I'm obviously in a hotel room working, so the gorgeousness is mostly outside. Well, Steve, I am in Berkeley, California, and let me flip my screen around here, and you can see. <laughs> Come on, move it. Come around. Ooh. Now, I can't see the screen now, but probably you're looking at my redwood trees. Nice. And it's 5 p.m. here, so we're losing daylight. Well, wherever you your screen is pointing, whatever part of the world you're in, or if you're listening to the recording, thanks so much for doing so and for taking the time out. So there is a Mighty Bell room for this session. I'm going to put the link in the chat. I've put some resources from Jay's work in that Mighty Bell room, and you can continue the conversation after the show in that space. And here you go. So Jay, I think you're going to take this as a compliment. 
Reading this book was like having a conversation with you. Well, that's the way it was written. <laughs> it was really enjoyable, in part because it felt to me like at many places in the book, I wanted to refer back to other spots in the book and make connections. And the conversational style of the book sort of does that. Well, thank you, but let me point out another feature of the book. You know, most people <laughs> pick up a business book and on average they read seven pages before they chuck it. So I have a cheat sheet in the back of this book that explains the whole thing in five pages. And my instructions up front are, hey, go there, find something you like, read that, then go to the real portion on that, read that first. So that people have a good experience rather than, yeah, you know, the intro drag or whatever. So um, I'm always selling people on the read the, the, the cheap version. I read a book years ago called How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. And I actually oh, I think this is maybe a, good way, maybe a good way to frame our conversation. Nobody ever taught me how to read a book except Mortimer Adler. And it so substantially changed my relationship with books that I feel in a lot of ways that it's informed my own personal learning strategies. And I feel like, you know, there's a, this great chapter in the middle of the book on learners. That to me felt like the heart of the book, that we're in a new relationship with information and there's this opportunity to build our own learning strategies. Well, no question about it. And, in fact, I've got a portion in this book on selective types of reading books. Like, you know, if you're not sure that this is a book for you or, you know, it starts out a little rocky, my God, just gut the book. You know, sort of read the first paragraph of each chapter, read the last chapter, look at the references, get a feel for it, and decide if you want to commit further. And if you do then there are ways to, you know, mind map what you're reading where you're going to retain it rather than read it and say, well, what was that about? It was obviously written for, for a business audience. We're going to make some connections today, I think, with learning in general. But maybe the most significant word in the title for me is the word rediscovering because it does feel as though in some way the web is helping us to remember alternative um, maps or understandings of what learning is? Well, truth be told, this book is six years old now. And while that seems like a short time, the way that we use the web today was very rare. Uh, I've got several sequels sort of ready to go, uh, which rely more on the web tools and how can we pull this in and how can indeed return us to a world where we can grab the content we want and uh, make do with it. So let's kind of launch into the book if we can. Um, the sort of guiding quote that you even devote a section in the back to is this idea that 80% of corporate learning is informal. So why is that? And why is it that we don't tell that story mostly when we're talking about learning? Well, and I'll mention that statistic is also out of date because now I think the formal learning part is probably down to 5 or 10% level. And a lot of it is we have this notion that learning is school, that it's what we did in school. It's when there was an authority figure who would lead us through content, not our choice, not our not our timing, uh, but th that was that was what you had to do. It had to be hard. It couldn't be fun, and it couldn't be by accident. It, it had to be by assignment. Uh, so that's why we expect it uh, to be well. The, why people are surprised by the eighty twenty ratio uh, because they don't think of learning, which is <laughs> informal picking it up from the School of Hard Knocks through trial and error. I was giving a presentation in the Middle East, and this was early on in promoting informal learning. And an executive vice president of a, well, of IBM, 
came up and said, well, how do you know this works, Jay? I mean, informal learning, come on, you know. He was head of relations with all universities. And I said, well, tell me, how do you learn to talk? How do you learn to walk? If you ask me now, I'd ask him, how do you learn to kiss? They're all, I mean, it isn't just in the corporate education space. Most learning is informal. It's us grabbing a hold of something that we want at the right time and playing with it and practicing with it and uh, making it part of our own and connecting it into, you know, the frameworks we have in our head. So that's the norm. And in fact, when I talk with instructional designers and they say, well, where should we begin, you know, sort of re-looking at our strategy, I go, well, informal first. If that's where most of the learning is, why aren't you looking at how you can accelerate that and make it better, make it easier, explain to people what's going on, rather than leave it up to chance, which is sort of our default. I now, I, I don't like to lecture people either, so I'm going to stop every now and then. Right. Well, and you, the show is about you, so you're welcome to go on as long as you would like. I have a good friend I really like who works in admissions. And um, he was telling me about some of these new schools that use the phrase inspire, not require. And his negative reaction to that, he just felt like it wasn't disciplined or hard-earned enough. Is, is what we're seeing here a fairly broad shift because of the web? We've been calling it a deinstitutionalization. And is it an exaggeration to think that this is part of a story of control and a shift in who has power? Well, it's 100% about control. I mean, you've nailed it. When something's informal, it's because it's not being forced on somebody by somebody else. But let's remember that 80-20 relationship of informal to formal, it's mainly pre-web. And it, it, it's before you do anything. I mean, that's what's happening right now. Now, if you see an opportunity to get more out of informal learning, hoorah, you know, that makes it better. But it's not like people – I know too many consultants who've said, oh, well, we're going we're gonna to implement informal learning. Well, duh, informal learning has already been implemented or, you know, the organization wouldn't learn anything and go out of business immediately. Uh, so it's not that we're going to implement some new program. It's that we're going to try to, to make access and motivation, things like that, simpler and more logical. We're going to take something that's there and make it better rather than import something new. I was thinking of... Oh, by the way... <laughs> I'm going to go like this when I'm through from now on. <laughs> but by the way, I, I mean, my thinking has advanced quite a bit since the book came out. So the book, I'll be glad to talk about the book, and it's got all kinds of structure, and half of it is available for free on the web, and the graphic that's at the bottom there is clickable, zoomable, and a real you know, quick way to learn it. Um, but I don't want us to just focus on the contents of an old book, because a lot of new stuff going on. <laughs> nice signaling. So, the, you know, I did spend some time on this conundrum, right, of we recognize the value of informal learning, then how do we promote it? And I was thinking about your bus versus bicycle analogy. And in, with this idea that the bus has a set number of stops and the bicycle sort of gives you some freedom. So how do you think, what do you think of this? That as we think about encouraging informal learning, it's kind of like building bike lanes, right? The better there are bike lanes and the more there are, the more choice there is to get around. Do you like that? I like that a lot. But let me point out another thing about bicycles, because right now I'm on the top of a hill, and if I walk 30 feet over that way, I can look at the Golden Gate Bridge from the top of the hill on the other side of the bay here. Uh, Oh, God, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. I, because I'm on a hill, there are all these characters, little spandex outfits with French advertisements on them, moaning and groaning to get up the hill. I mean, we have thousands of bicyclists. And, you know, one of them breaks down, and the next person stops to help. Because it's a reinforcement of we're in it together. 
And if a place has a, a healthy learning culture that's, you know, supporting its bike riders and clearing new bike paths, that's going to happen all over the place. People say, hey, you don't get that? Well, let's talk about it. Because it's informal, right? You can do anything you want. There aren't any specific restrictions about don't do this or that's cheating or it's not academic. Uh, it's, it's whatever you want to do. And the camaraderie of the bike riders is just fantastic. And a good reason that informal learning often packs more wallop than formal learning. So funny to use the bicycle analogy because then you, uh, it reminds me, I think, of something John Seeley Brown said about the development of the mountain bike and the degree to which that was sort of co-development between the actual practitioners and then the manufacturers who kind of followed suit to make what the bicyclists needed. Well, at, at first, I mean, the, the bike, the, that bike was invented right over yonder. I can see the hilltop. But at first, it wasn't manufactured. It was, it was a prototype. And, you know, there were these funky things where people had put bigger wheels than the frame was supposed to support and whatever. And eventually, they had enough of a jury-rigged model together that they could say, yeah, let's manufacture some of those. But the part that JSV talks about is, I think, the earlier on, when it's in the discovery phase, uh, and it, it's, you know, I, I think it's a marvelous concept. And there's one other thing we might throw in. People who ride mountain bikes always ride with others. Because if you make a mistake, you can kill yourself, or you might be at the bottom of a ravine or something like that. And increasingly, learning for an organization with a purpose, corporate learning, you've got to have groups of people learning things. And it's no longer, I have to know everything. I have to do all the bike paths myself. No, I'll do some stuff. Steve will do some stuff. Together, we'll make one hell of a team. Uh, and I think organizations are just waking up to that. I mean, Look at most LMS. It's what do they measure? One person at a time. Formal learning only. So there was a little, you know, maybe two percent of the learning that's going on. Good for the signal. <laughs> I, you know, I, I jumped the gun. <laughs> you I forgot. forgot. <laughs> There's a little bit of a dilemma for me, or maybe even a little bit of a conflict, right? Because as I, as I went through the chapter on the learner, I was reminded of an interview I did. Uh, with a guy who wrote a book called Buck in Your Scholar, in which he talked about kind of building your own learning ecology and the importance of really discovering what works for you. And I certainly know that, you know, I go through periods of 20 minutes of productivity that can outdo a day of being non-productive. And as you sort of discover your own cycles. So how do you balance that kind of need for understanding the independence of how we work individually with the larger group needs? I have a hard time breaking out the management issue there from the learning issue. Uh, it, you know, it depends on what organization you're working with, and there's some things that ideally you might not do, but with the culture, that's the way we do it here, and you're, you're sort of stuck with it. People, knowledge workers, creative workers, whatever we're going to call them, no longer have sort of the standard output for a standard unit of time. So Google says a, a top flight hire, the best of the best, not just 800 board scores and leading class at MIT, but somebody who's good, that person is going to produce 200 times more value to their organization than the you know, just average uh, hire at Google. 200 times more. Well, I'm not going to have that person riding a bike. I'm going to hire them a limousine. So they can say, I want to go over there, make it easy for me. It's worth over-investing in those folks, making it, you know, especially compelling for them to hop on things and learn them fast. So I guess I'm putting a stake through the heart of uh, equal opportunity in ways when I say that. <laughs> Just rambling on, I'm getting into trouble here. We'll Cut that okay, but, but and again, I know the book isn't written about school, but we may get to some conclusions or thoughts about schooling. But what about the case of Yahoo, right, where with a new CEO who comes in and says, being together, having conversations is so important that you can no longer work from home. 
uh, that really feels uh, hard for me to respond to because it seems to, in one way to acknowledge what you've described, but in another way to conflict with it. Well, two weekends ago, I was with a guy who uh, had worked at Yahoo for quite a bit, and he had a different take. I mean, out here in the valley, the, the word is, well, what's with Marissa? She's just copying bad crap from Google, where also you don't work from home most of the time. Uh, and uh, actually, the guy pointed out, well, hold it, you know. This ideal of sort of bumping into people in the hallways and, you know, we're always there in the office to go, that'd be fine if Yahoo didn't have 11,000 employees spread around the world. I mean, the, the boys in Singapore and the girls in China are not going to randomly bump into somebody in Santa Clara just because, you know, something's set up. Uh, Marissa had a problem. Uh, it's the installed base, if you will, the reputation. I think she could have started from scratch with Google, with uh, Yahoo, if she had that luxury, and could have had any policy you wanted. What hurts is it feels like I don't trust you if you've got an open policy, and then you say, we're changing that. Now you've got to show up in the office at 8. Uh, it, it's, you know, inconsistent. Uh, we'll, we'll see how this one plays out. I know I work for my home offices. And uh, for me, it would be, I'm leaving. You know, if they said you have to come into the office all the time. Traffic around Yahoo is terrible, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, drifting again. You know, I shouldn't do these this late in the day, Steve. I'm much, much sharper in the morning. Waiting for the signal. Well, so let's, let's make a small comparison with education, right? So education right now, or at least a lot of the narratives around education in the world are driven by these test results or test scores. So what is it that uh, you've learned about how organizations can facilitate different ways of thinking about outcome or output that might be useful when faced with this um, results-based learning that depends on a set of scores that may not have really have much to do with actual learning. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I know, you know, a little bit about schools. I helped on the University of Phoenix, and I write papers on the future of education. But uh, to me, there's a big, big problem with tests, and that is that grades are meaningless outside of the school system. I mean, I can't imagine a more random variable. You'd think that if you said, hey, you're straight A's, you're wonderful, you're going to, you know, blow the top off, or you're an underachiever, you could do much better than this, your grades are terrible. But no, people graduate from school and they have the same income, the same level of happiness, the same likelihood to be addicted to heroin, or a bunch of other things, regardless of their GPA. So I, I think we've been measuring the wrong thing, both in schools and in corporations. Corporations have sort of their no child left behind equivalent in compliance tests and just post-tests, pre-tests, a bunch of hang-ups that we did for the Defense Department 20 years ago and have outworn their welcome. Uh, I think that the, the measure of learning is whether you can do what you set out to learn. And if you can't demonstrate that in a simulation, in a, a, a real-life case, being reviewed by your peers on what you're doing, well, then I think accountability is out of the window. And I think that's true for schools as well as for uh, corporations and nonprofits. Well, that's part of the difficulty, right, is that school, that we define schooling largely as about the accumulation of knowledge rather than learning to do things. So there's uh, a young man named Nikhil Goyal who wrote a book called One Size Does Not Fit All who's, I think, all of 18 right now, a very deeply researched yeah. book, who's calling for students to revolt, to actually leave schools, and not just to leave schools, but to leave schools and start their own learning communities. How do you respond to that kind of a pronouncement? Well, I, I respond about the way I respond to Peter Thiel, giving people a million dollars to drop out of school. Uh, you know, maybe it'll work for a few people, but it's not going to be the norm. 
uh, God, school, we're often dealing with novices. Well, they need structure. They, they need targets. They need, they can't just go total free form. Think, you know, back to the bus and the bicycle. I'm not saying throw out all the bus routes. I'm saying have the bus routes available for novices, for people who need structure, who need to memorize the basics, who need something to, to then go exploring on. Uh, if you just throw people into something and say figure it out, well, a lot of them are never going to figure it out. Uh, they need other other support to do so. Did that get after the, the I issue? think so. And I would want to draw a connection with your phrase, engineering a learning network, because it feels to me like uh, Seymour Papert's work actually ties really well with that, this idea that you can build a better structure for helping people to learn while respecting their self-direction? I, I think so. Frankly, I'm not current enough with Pepper's work to say, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, but I, I want to do a little homework before I really uh, said that uh, I'm, I'm following his lead there. Okay, so uh, tell us what you mean when you use the word emergence. Uh, I'll try to be kind to listeners. I think the phenomenon of complexity is a major thing changing our world. And emergent phenomenon are things that come from complex systems. That, that grow out of interactions. It, it, it may be stuff like the uh, apocryphal butterfly in Brazil flapping its wings and causing a tornado in Texas. Uh, but more and more things these days are unpredictable, are volatile. There, there are just so many different things going on. That it, it's, it's a nonlinear world all of a sudden. Almost all of our education system is set up with the assumption that things are predictable, that complexity does not exist, that Newtonian mechanics and sort of clockwork universe is the way it is. And that's obsolete thinking. I'm so glad you brought up JSB because what he talks about, if you look at you know the way that the surfers learn and things like that, they're learning something that's really complex. They're learning patterns. They're learning emotions. They are, in his words, not learning to do, they're learning to be. And there's a difference if you're going to be a world-class surfer just rather than me, know how, but not, not be it. Uh, I got, well, I had an article I wrote uh, two days ago on my blog. I, I blab on my blog all the time, so if somebody wants, they can come to internettime.com and see all this. But how no training department that I know is at all equipped to deal with complexity. And I think that it's going to take decentralizing the administration of learning down to local managers and supervisors, because the way that somebody is going to learn something like that is to be given a stretch assignment, and it's do or die. I mean, if I want you to be good in international business, I'm going to send you on the next deal in Germany. I'm not going to have you go to Berlitz. Uh, so I, I, I think emergence and complexity and unpredictability are the, the watchwords that uh, are going to dominate the conversation for the next 10 years. So your thinking about emergent learning led me to thinking about agile development and kind of the process of testing things out and experimentation. And that led me to this idea of agile or emergent living. Right, where your life, where you're willing in your life to kind of shift, rethink, move on. Um, does it seem as though there, it, that if we think about where our students will be in 10 or 20 years, that their lives will need to be kind of agile? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, they'll be living in it, but we're not going to have sort of optional, you graduated, forget about learning anymore. Um, the screen just flipped for some reason. Did you do that? I did. Ah, it's coming back, I guess. Or no, no. Oh, yes. 
One of one of my favorite uh, scenes from a movie. There, the whole uh, I have Marshall McLuhan right here. You know nothing of my work. You know, it's <laughs> just ah, so rewarding. Uh, but indeed, this is the uh, working blog site that we have flipped up here. Um, I'm good at losing track today. Let's see, we had complexity and emergence. Emergent living. And, oh, I know, I know, I know. January before last, I joined a group of 19 other people on the top of a mountain in Switzerland. And we were using that analogy because 10 years before then, the actual manifesto had been route, written on top of a mountain when a bunch of professionals got together. And our collection of people were agile developers, mainly teachers and uh, coaches and things like that, management theorists. We had a few people from some pretty advanced companies. Uh, but we, we were all big picture thinkers, if you will. And we came out with definitions of the structures that we saw, thought we'll see in the future world. And essentially, organizations should be viewed as living systems. And the job of a manager is to be a steward of the living, not of you know, job roles or something like that. It's going to become a much more people-focused world. And Agile lets you deal with things like emotion because it's coming in such tight little packets. Uh, all of this stuff is on the web. We're debating continuously. And there are like oh, 10 different management movements of which this is one. And we try to be sort of a clearinghouse. If anybody's interested, if you Google the mountain's name, you'll quickly find some of our statements and some of the meetings in Europe and the US that are going on. The mountain is STOS, which is S-T-O-O-S. -O -O so it, it looks like it ought to be STOS, but no, it's in Swiss German, so it's STOS. Uh, I, I, I think we're going to see Agile, Lean, Kanban, the, the whole Schutenbergs permeating organizations in a big, big way. In a complex world, you can't afford to, you know, sort of uh, bet, all, bet all, everything on one big project. My God, the world will change if you do that. The world's going to change it anyway, and it's going to happen faster and faster. So tell us about serious play. Well, serious play I, I go from the book by that name, uh, Michael Schrage. Now a lot of people are looking at uh, bigger pictures, if you will. But the thing is, it's crazy to denigrate play as a way to learn things. Now, is right now sort of a fetish on uh, gaming and uh, gamifying and a few other terrible terms. Uh, but if learning's fun, and you know you've got an objective, and you've got some competition in the gameplay and stuff like that. But why the hell not? Schrager's contribution was just to say, don't laugh this out of the room, because I mean, I, I know a number of companies that five years ago would not let you use the word game, and it's the same way that ten years ago the management of Sun Microsystems would not let you use the word process. I mean, just stupid moves, you know, throw out the, the, the baby and the bathwater in, in a hurry. Uh, I, I think that games should be taken seriously and that uh, somebody who denies it is just missing the boat. So as I said, I just loved the section on learners. And, the, and I know the book is now a little bit older. But it was fascinating to me that you gave writing advice because that said sort of loudly and clearly, part of the role of the learner is now to be a contributor. And that was your intent, right? Well, actually, the way that that stuff all got in there, because there, you know, there are a number of things, how to take notes, uh, is when I first conceptualized the book, I wanted half of it to be the sort of organizational frame, and half of it 
could be advice for individual learners to say, look, there's some things you're only going to learn with other people, so go find the best people you can and learn with them. Don't, you know, break your pick trying to figure out something you're never going to be able to, to get to. So the editors, the publisher said, no, people will not understand a book like that because books ought to be sort of one idea, not two. So the learner's chapter is what's left of a chapter that was 90% bigger when I wrote the book. And I just ripped a lot of things out of it and said, well, you know, we can live without this. I don't want to. And now I've got a draft of a book on how to learn. Um, and a lot of it's tips and tricks and, you know, memory things and uh, whatever. But, you know, I, I still want to write that part. <laughs> That's the book I definitely want to read. So um, another favorite part of my book was your description of your personal meta-learning practices. Do you want to talk a little bit about sort of what you've learned about your own learning? On one condition. Remind me what I said about my meta-learning practices. It's on page 81, and I, we can go to it. But what it did for me was it really helped. Wait, just a second. Let me grab the book. Okay. I'll be right back. How darn funny. What a nice man. Oh, yes. Well, this is a very unscientific uh, couple of pages. Because what I did is I just kept a list of conditions in which I seemed to learn better. So the one you're talking about is think holistically, take frequent trips to the balcony. To me, if you're looking at a process and it's all confused, usually if you go up to the balcony or up in a helicopter and look back down, things become more clear. Set learning goals and monitor progress. I mean, how many people fail to do something that simple? Right now, I'm uh, finishing up a two-month intellectual walkabout. A walkabout, well, you're in Australia now. You know, the Aborigines had a wonderful knowledge-centered culture before we white guys came in and destroyed it. But part of youth was a walkabout where you just drop everything and go out and walk around the countryside. And amazingly enough, 100 years ago, just about any Aborigine over the age of 30 could walk the entire country of Australia knowing where things are and where they're going to appear and what you have to be ready for. Just phenomenal. And all from running by walking around. Let's see. Keep a journal and blog. I... I used to be tremendously shy. I was an introvert, and I just kept to myself. And then I had sort of a personality makeover. And now I learn by listening to myself talk. <laughs> and it, but it always used to be that I'd write things in a journal, and then I'd reflect on what was in the journal. And blogging, for me, has been just a marvelous way to learn things. I mean... It, it causes you to sort of focus and shape up, well, what's the story here? And uh, I, I, for, I don't know, for eight years I blogged every single day. Seek process improvements. I mean, indeed, uh, people would drive me crazy if they say, well, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I go, no. Maybe it ain't broke, but it can be a lot better than it is, so improve it. So... Those are essentially, uh, you know, my uh, meta learning, if you will. Uh, common sense might be another way to describe it. I'm so glad you said something. You said, uh, I learned by listening to hear myself talk. Now, this is something that I have really noticed about myself. Uh, there's an old Irish saying, how will I know what I think until I hear myself say it? I actually think there's something of real significance and value 
in conversation. And you even have a section of the book on conversation. Do you want to say any more about that role of conversation and learning? Conversation is so vital. Uh, to me, conversations are the stem cells of human learning. And it, it's like magic. I mean, you know, if you look, if you read a transcript of a con conversation you've had with somebody, it's gibberish. It, you know, it doesn't make sense. But if you see a video of the conversation where you can see the expressions and the, the flow and how things just take off, it, it's totally amazing. I think that your neurons have a lot to do with it. I mean, if I'm feeling some of your feelings and you're feeling some of my feelings, that's going on at the same time. The surface level is just exchanging content. If I go into an organization and see that, well, things aren't working quite right, one of the first things I do is say, you know, let's fix it where it's easier to host conversations. It's not wasted time. John Akers, when he was the, uh, just about took IBM down the tubes before Lou Gerstner came in, was giving a talk at a Canadian IBM plant, and he said, I don't want to see anybody just standing around a water cooler having conversations. I want to see you work. And he didn't realize that that standing around is the way engineers work, that they swap ideas and they sort of, you know, compete. Here's a neat way to do this and that kind of stuff. And if you cut that out, it <laughs> you just shot yourself in the foot. I was talking to Hewlett Packard once, and I was oh, a, a couple of large rooms away from uh, the CEO's office. And I've got all these, they had 35 different learning organizations inside at the time. All these learning organizations are on, remotely on it. And I said, you know, you got a conversation. They said, well, what can we do about that? And I said, well, the first thing you could do is rip out all these stinking little bitty cubicles. Real estate was valuable close to CEO. Just rip those suckers out and put in Italian leather sofas and espresso machines and rolling whiteboards, and the, the people will use it. Uh, but if you don't have that, you mean that they're only going to be able to have conversations when they spoke in a parking lot, and that's, you know, that's suboptimal. <laughs> so uh, your book allowed me some reflection time on some other things, and one of which was the way I learned running the interview series. So I read the book using my best uh, Mortimer Adler skills. Then I uh, have taken notes, uh, and I have the conversation with the author. But the, the core, probably most significant learning for me is in the hours spent translating my notes into a set of questions that will help both guide the audience who may not know your work and you in, in being able to tell it. But I'm not even sure it's the... It's that setup. It's the it's the using of my notes to go one step further, and that's worth about 20 hours of other learning time. Um, are there ways that you can think that we could pragmatically make changes to schools now that would improve that kind of learning for students? Yeah, I mean there 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 are too many of them. I mean there's a lot to talk about there. Um, for so long, and I recognize this is changing at the lower grades, but for so long we discouraged all conversation and dealing with other people as part of the learning process. It was you know hey that's cheating or. Uh, just shut up, don't disrupt the lecture, and, you know, all of the bad stuff we know about. And uh, opening that up and giving people the freedom of choice and how they learn things, it, it, it's, it's powerful medicine, and it really works. It's back to the control thing. Uh, control is absolutely the crux of the issue. And also there's the thing that, you know, I... I love to learn, and I hate to be taught. If, you know, a teacher says something, I'm just made for argumentation. <laughs> I'm a cut up. Um, but if I get to, to choose the people I talk with and things, I'm planning a vacation in Europe right now, 
And I was thinking about, well, stuff I haven't seen or museums that have been revamped. And then I said, no, it's the wrong way. I'm going to base a vacation around people I want to talk to in Europe. And I'm going to do interviews with them. And there's, you know, taking a page out of your book, Steve. Those, those interviews, you know, I want to post them on the web and consolidate it into a book. Uh, much more fun than just seeing one more cathedral. So since I'm on a form of... I'm getting stylish here. Chris. Yeah, you're doing a good job. So that's interesting as a comparison because what <laughs> I've discovered for myself is I found these really inexpensive around the world tickets. So we've taken our 14-year-old daughter and are actually going around the world. And I'm enjoying it most when we don't have plans and we have to figure it out every day. The, the process of kind of discovery mm. and... Um, that the pre-planning would take away the excitement and the serendipity of so many great connections that we've made. And so so that's even interesting, right, the comparison of how two people might approach the same trip, an interesting analogy. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so we've got uh, just under 15 minutes left. Uh, we're going to make sure that we start looking for Q&A for questions in the chat. Uh, so if you have a question for Jay, please feel free to put it in the chat, or if you'd like, you can raise your virtual hand. That's the third icon over in the participant window. It's a hand, and I'll give you the microphone if you do so. Jay, because I'm such a big proponent of unconferences, I thought it might be interesting to have you kind of describe the value for you of these events where the conversations build at the moment. Lots of value. I, I lead a charm life. I just fall into being at the right place. So I, I attended the first bar camp, which is sort of the, the opening gun for unconference land. And the ability to change the agenda as you go through and just follow people's interests or take advantage of contributions that you didn't know were going to come. It can work magic. There were, how many, 40 of us at a retreat in Texas two weeks ago. And you know a lot of the names. They're, they're instructional designers who wouldn't admit to being instructional designers because we're out to change the world, not to write another training program. And the fellow who started it said, okay, here are the rules. First, there are no rules. Anything goes. You want to ask somebody something? Ask them. You want to create your own thing? Do it. And we came out knowing about topics and fields that we didn't even know that we knew them. <laughs> we, we didn't know we were going to bump into things or how it was all going to fit together. But, you know, there's something that when humans are working together sort of goes into overdrive and, you know, you think they can turn out like total crap, but it doesn't. The small events that I go to, three dozen or so, are so much more rewarding than going to one of these cattle drive things where the vendors are trying to twist your arm and everybody drinks too much and, you know, it's just sort of, oh, ho-hum, another annual, no, I won't even mention names, but another annual one of those. <laughs> uh, informal and Un or, or brothers. I mean, you know, they, they go together. I worked for the company. Well, I, I worked uh, with Inside Smart Force, and we changed it from being a distributor of computer based education to the e learning company. Uh, and that, that was an, <laughs> an interesting experience in itself. And I'm losing my train of thought. I have no idea what I was going to tell you about that. <laughs> oh, no, I know. We, 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 we spent God knows how many person years planning our annual sales event. And you know, it probably wouldn't be any better than if we'd just woken up the morning before the event and said, what do we want to talk about? There, there's a whole infrastructure of time wasters who just plan meetings that don't turn out very well. I think that also indicates the importance of a creation and participation. And so it's not just what the topics were, but it's the, the learner as creator. 
the learner is creator and the learner is monitor. I mean, one of the there are no rules, but there is the law of two feet, which says that you know if you're not interested and or adding to the topic at hand, use your feet and go somewhere else. Don't don't put up with it. You know, I I, I always sit in the front row of conference events because my hearing's not very good. I get to talk with interesting people that way, but. Uh, Oh, now I have three ideas going on in my head at once. Uh, and now it disappeared. <laughs> God, somebody better ask his question, <laughs> Steve, or I'm going to lose it. We've got a question. Okay, so uh, uh, George wonders, in higher ed, in education, higher or K-12, how do you encourage informal learning without it becoming a program that stagnates? Um, well, I'd probably leave it at how do you encourage informal learning, and it's by valuing it, and it's by letting it happen, and it's by encouraging and sort of fan the flames. I mean, there's uh, the old thing of learning is not, uh, learning is igniting a flame, not filling a bucket. Uh, if the circumstances are set up right, you'd be amazed how people, even in a conservative uh, educational establishment, can create just fantastic stuff and no limits, uh, go beyond. I mean, I've seen kids grapple with projects. Well, I was, uh, I, I wrote the first business curriculum for the University of Phoenix. This is a long, long, long time ago. And I, uh, I had to be an adjunct faculty member just to, you know, keep me honest, make sure that the instructions I wrote could be followed. And boy, we had people when they were looking at how you do a business plan for a local business, they did one. And I, I remember one presentation. He said, "Well, you know, there's this restaurant that a little bit down in the dumps, and we thought, well, you know, we could take that over. So we we got a small business loan and." Uh, we managed to get another $2 million out of the bank, and we talked to the chef, and we found the cooks for from this. And they go through this thing, and my God, we were all convinced that, you know, they were leaving the bank to start a restaurant. No, it was just an assignment, but they figured, well, let's play it for real. You know, act like we did all these things. They, stuff like that just comes out of the woodwork once you remove all the restrictions, both mental and administrative and say, oh, if this is sort of the area you want to learn about, do something. So, Jay, why do you say in the book, in, in your letter to Curtis Bonk, that you consider blended learning a useless concept? Well, now that's, that's rooted in the time it was uh, stated. And, in fact, my introduction to Kurt Bonk's uh, handbook of blended learning says, Kurt asked me to write this, and I write the introduction. I turned him down. And he asked me again. I turned him down. And he asked me again. I said, well, okay, but I'm going to trash it. Because people who were silly enough to think that learning could be totally computerized, a little group of venture capitalists down in the valley wasted a lot of money on that, uh, they, they just wanted to remove the people and have this great financial formula that was going to work. Well, it didn't work. Um, uh, Jay, where's your head these days? Steve, help me out. What the hell was I talking about? <laughs> you were talking um, about uh, venture capitalists and the um, idea that you could remove the instructor and how it related to blended learning, blended courses, blended learning is a useless concept. Uh, Blended. Blended was the word I was looking for. Blended used to mean, oh, we implemented something that was 100% computerized, and we found it didn't work. So we've added workshops or meetings or something to bring the people back in and make it work. Well, that, that's, you know, rationalizing mistake. That's, that's not some new great concept of learning. And the blends that ought to be looked at are how diverse a group do we want to do things together? And not just is it 
human or computer, but all the other spectra of things that can go in between there that can lead to enriching learning. So at the beginning of Kurt's book, I listed off like a dozen other blends, uh, all for having more than one way to do stuff, but uh, not the idea. I don't think it's meaningful if somebody said, oh, we have blended learning. Yeah, uh, I assume it's in your mother tongue too. You know, you breathe air when you do it. It, it just it didn't add any any value to say it was blended. So I, I enjoy uh, <laughs> destroying bad shit. <laughs> Oops, did we miss one? I've got dead air here. Well, I hope people can hear me. Um, and, and by the way, on use of off-color color language, uh, it has been found that you retain more if there's at least one swear word because it means that it's sort of uh, impromptu and spontaneous rather than all planned. So I cheat a little. Well, I see Steve Hargadon has joined the session. I, my connection dropped. I, I probably missed the most brilliant things that you said, so I apologize. I'll have to watch my own recording. Oh, well, th yeah, the others can tell you about it. It was really good. <laughs> So, Jay, we try and finish the show on time so that we, um, um, as a courtesy to our guests, and uh, Coach Carroll has one final question, which is, where are the free bits of your book, please? Ah, if you go to jaycross.com, J-A-Y-C-R-O-S-S.com, and that's the site where I put things that are more formal, Whereas the other one, the Internet Time, is where things are happening and the experiments are going on all the time. But jcross.com has got up at the top, one of the places you can go is the Informal Learning Center. And there you'll find graphics, you'll find links to, I don't know, 80 articles on informal learning. Uh, there's just some discussion that's going on there. Uh, so. That is that is the place for you know looking up uh, freebies and papers and stuff like that. Jay, I'm going to ask the final question: Do we have a moral obligation, given the potential of every individual to be a learner? Do we have a moral obligation to shift how we think about learning? I believe in timelines too, and the answer is yes, absolutely. No question. We, it is criminal for us to let some of the practices that we live with go on. You know, the world can be better than that. So let's just do it. Jay, thanks so much. This has really been delightful. I, I, you know, I, I love the book. I love talking with you. I sure hope that the association continues. Uh, appreciate your coming on the show. Well, thank you so much. Uh, enjoyable talking with you. And if others have got questions, uh, I'm eminently findable. Just ask them. Okay. Hey, thanks, everybody, for coming. The book is Informal Learning, Rediscovering the Natural Pathways that Inspire Innovation and Performance. And go to jcross.com. Coming up on the Future of Education tomorrow, Gina B. And Keeney talks about the power of groups and Mighty Bell and then Adam Bessie on the global ed reform movement. Take care, everybody. Bye now. Thanks, Jay. <laughs>